All right. Uh, good afternoon or good evening. Uh, Buonasera. Uh, we're going to continue in this session, we're going to continue discussing uh, the remaining sections of uh, chapter seven, the time series regression models, and also see if we have time to start discussing the first exercise in the section 7.10 uh, uh, to apply the theory that we have uh, seen so far uh, to a practical problem. Also, I'm going to share my screen now. Also, I want to uh, point out some resources that can be helpful uh, to develop a deeper understanding of the topics that we're discussing or also expand them. So one of the, uh, uh, one of the references that I just, you know, uh, found this out uh, during this week is uh, one of the authors, uh, Rob Hinman. Uh, one of the authors has a, a blog, and usually he publishes uh, different articles on a particular topic. In in this one, for example, uh, he's talking about tidy forecasting, which was discussed in chapter five, uh, using R, and there's some. Uh, good information here that it, they don't cover in the book. So they're kind of expanding or complementing uh, the information uh, that is not in the book, uh, complementing here in the blog. So this is a good, a good uh, reference. Also, I found this one, okay? It's called Applied Time Series Analysis for Fisheries and Environmental Sciences. And also a very good, uh references for uh trying to understand the math uh behind the you know some of the time series models and also is it comes with examples and expands uh some of the concepts that we have also been discussing so those two i posted in the in the chat chat so they would appear eventually in the in the slag uh, uh log okay so let's start discussing what we came, came here. Uh, we stop just beginning uh, section 7.4, which is titled Evaluating the Regression Model. And the author starts with a section in terms of uh, uh, giving us some useful predictors or what they're called extra re uh, uh, exterior regressors that can help in the forecasting of the of your of, of your time series. For example, in the time series, it says if it is univariate, you are going to have a, a day component, right? Day or time component, and the, the values that that you are uh, observing. It could be temperature, it could be uh, sales, uh, it could be you know any any numeric. Uh, uh, magnitude vector. So what happens is that there could be other predictors that are happening in the same time as the as the value that you are that you are studying, they are serving that can help. For example, we can use a trend component, right? If you see that the the time series is having an increase over time or a decrease over time, then you can use a trend component, okay? And we have seen that when we do the, comp the composition, STL, seasonal uh, uh, trend uh, linearity, uh, we see that that trend component right, right there. And you can attest if your time series in a whole is, you know, increasing, decreasing, or 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 or, or, be, or being stable across time. Then you have what we call dummy variables, right? And one of the best examples of dummy variables is, for example, if you are doing a retail uh, time series, you are studying the behavior of uh, sales, uh, total sales over a particular period, right? Uh, weekly sales, 
monthly sales, uh, quarterly sales, et cetera. One of the things that you can then add to your mix of predictors is uh, if the day or the time that the sales was recorded, if it was a public holiday or not, okay? For example, in the US, we know that this, you know, the, the what is called the federal holidays, for example, uh, Independence Day, uh, Christmas Day, Labor Day, Memorial Day, et cetera, usually uh, retail business try to push, right? A certain uh, marketing offers, et cetera, to try to uh, drive uh, demand. So that could create some interesting uh, spikes in your time series that then that uh, regressor, that predictor, you know, could be helpful to incorporate the model and then uh, try to forecast even, eventually for the next year or the next period, if the holiday occurs, then you can have a signal in your model for uh, forecasting a better, uh, doing a better forecast with that, with that, uh, with that value. Then also you have a seasonal, right? Seasonal uh, variables. A again, in the decomposition, we have trend, we have seasonality. And usually seasonality is going to be kind of a repetitive uh, pattern in your time series. It could be uh, weekly, right? For example, in this table, uh, you can create from the date uh, variable, you can create uh, dummy variables for the, the days of, of the week, right? So then when something happens, let's say a Monday that is repetitive in your time series, then the model will capture that because it has that, uh, that variable you know, to signal you know, that this is uh, occurring in a Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, okay? And uh, one of the examples, that uh, we're going to see, let me see if I jump here, right, in the notes, is the Australian quarterly uh, beer production. So here from the uh, data set uh, called AUS underscore production, uh, you have different uh, commodities, okay? You have uh, uh, bricks, we have seen bricks, uh, clay bricks, we have seen uh, different tobacco, etc. and one of them is, uh, it's a beer uh, production. Uh, who doesn't like beer, right? Anyway, uh, we can filter this uh, using uh, the tidyverse uh, filter command. We can filter this to the values of each quarter of beer production in Australia that begins in 1992, because that's where our interest is from 1992 you know, and so on. So we have this as recent production. And then one of the things that we should always do is plot to see visually, to see if there's an increase, a trend, you know, is there a trend in the time series? Is there some seasonality and so forth? So here we can notice that the trend, which is that blue line uh, is decreasing. So we can see that from the period that we're studying, which is from 1992 to around 2010, uh, we're seeing that the, the beer uh, production in Australia is uh, declining, okay? And that's something that we can use in the trend component, we can use as a predictor. Also, we see that there is a consistent pattern of up and downs between, uh, it could be a year, right? or it could be a year and a half, et cetera. That's what we need, that decomposition to determine if this has a yearly um, uh, seasonality, okay? And that's what we call seasonality here. So, uh, and the exercise is that we want to forecast the future production of beer using those components, the linear trend and some quarterly uh, dummy variables, because our periods are defined by the quarters. So we're going to have four uh, domain, domain variables for each of, of the quarters, okay? Let me see what we have here, okay. So we're going to use the TSLM uh, function, okay? Which 
it's very similar to the LM uh, function that we have in base R, but this one is tailored for time series. In other words, it can uh, accept some uh, predictors that are not related to date that can then help us uh, do a better forecast. And one of the predictors, due to the predictors that we're going to be incorporating here, apart from the target, which is the beer, is the trend and the seasonality. And we said that the seasonality is by quarters, right? So we're going to have seasonality one as one only variable, seasonality two, three, and four, all right? So we fit the model with the LSTSLM. And then instead of uh, using summary, that that's the traditional way to view uh, uh, the, the stats from the linear regression, we're going to use report. Okay, that's tailored to the time series uh, uh, package. So here, we're going to have a similar output like the summary report that we have in the LM or GLM uh, functions, base R functions, but then we're going to see that we have a coefficient for the trend and also a coefficient for season two, three, four. You would ask, okay, but you told me that there were four, right? Therefore, so what happened to the season one? Well, remember, if you use season as a factor in R, what it's going to do is that it's going to one hot encode that, 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 uh, that variable, which is a factor, you know, a label, categorical label. But then there's going to be one that is going to be the base. And usually that base, which is, good, is going to be the season of year one, is not going to be uh, shown, all right? So for example, if you have a categorical variable that has, uh, let's say, uh, gender, right? It has male and female. If you do the linear regression in R, one of them is going to be the base and the other one is going to be shown in the, in the, uh, in the summary, okay? And the coefficient is going to be based on that, on that uh, particular one that is not, is not shown, okay? So uh, one of the things that we can notice here also in the report is that the adjusted R square, I'm going to talk a little more about those, which is a metric to try to determine fit, goodness of, of, of fit of the model is quite, quite good, okay? Right now we have uh, rounded to two decimals, we have 0.92 of our, 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 our adjusted R square. Uh, one will be the maximum, which is perfect, uh, per perfect relationship. Okay, so let's continue. And then now what, that we have a model, right? The fit beer model, which is the fitted model, then we can use from the broom package, we can use augment. And augment, what it's going to give us is the uh, predictors, okay, values, but also it's going to give us the fitted, which is the forecasted value in this case, which is the prediction, the predictions. Then it's going to give us the residuals, okay, which is the difference between the observed value and the forecasted values. And also uh, what is introduced in time series, which is innovation residuals, which are the adjusted residuals. So here we're going to bend, then plot the, the actual uh, beer values, right? Quarterly beer values. And then we're going to also plot the fitted values, which is the predictions, the forecast, the forecast in this case. And as you can see, if from the visual representation of the plot, it has a pretty good uh, fit. Uh, we can see that some of the spikes the model is kind of underestimating uh, those spikes. So that can be improved. But in general, with that R score, uh, adjusted R square of 0.92, uh, we think that we have a good, a, a good, a good fitted uh, model. If we go to a, an interactive using Plotly uh, uh, package, okay, and we uh, convert the ggplot object to a plotly, uh, we can then interact with this, you know, uh, 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 plot. Okay, and for example, we can see clearly 
here in the beer, which is the actual values that we can see that the fitted value sometimes it doesn't reach that spike that we are, you know, that, that we're observing. So usually I would say that this model is kind of underestimating uh, that, 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 uh, that spike. So we, we, it needs, probably it needs more signaling, more signaling to get a little bit, uh, estimate better that spike. Okay. So here's another visualization from the book. This is the visualization of the values by quarter. And what the authors are bringing is that uh, we usually see those spikes in the fourth quarter. In other words, the fourth quarter is the one that has the highest uh, demand of beer for each of the periods, the highest demand of beer. And then we can see other periods that have lesser demand. But this graph, what it shows is that the, those spikes correspond to the, that fourth uh, quarter, okay? Okay, so uh, the authors also introduce another technique uh, to get more signal uh, to, your, uh, to your model, which is using Fourier uh, analysis, uh, a series. So a Fourier analysis, a series, what it does is that it converts the date component, it converts us into a cosine and sinus uh, waves. And we have seen this in, for example, in physics, it's come from physics and applied mathematics, that we can see that the Fourier has that you know, sinusoidal uh, pattern, which is good to signal the model for multiple seasonalities, okay? In this case, we're going to see, because we're only dealing with one seasonality, which is, which is, is the year seasonality by the quarters, we're going to use a series, a simple Fourier series with what is called K2. And K is a parameter of the seasonality period. So usually what happens is that the K is equal to M divided by two, and M is going to be the seasonal period. So here, we clearly see that we have four, right? Four uh, seasonal periods, quarter one, two, three, four. So the Fourier a K is going to be, in this case, going to be two because four divided by two is going to be two. So now you're going to have a cosine uh, wave signaling one of the seasonalities and then the sine wave uh, with the pattern of the other offset Seasonality. And because the waves go ups and downs, then you have the four, you know, the four periods that you want to, the, that, that you want to forecast. Okay. And interestingly, when we use the Fourier instead of the seasonality, we basically get the same, the same R squared, adjust R squared. In other words, the seasonality uh, component and the Fourier component, they are interchangeable. All right, so as, as you go and uh, get some more complex time series with multiple seasonalities, Fourier series can help uh, address the signal of multiple seasonalities. Let's say monthly seasonality, quarterly, uh, biannual, yearly, and so forth, okay? So we're going to, you know, uh, let, it, let it simmer the first series, but if you want more information, I suggest that you look, you know, to the uh, corresponding references for Fourier, which is seen more in the physics and the applied mathematics uh, uh, fields. All right. So one of the things that uh, in the machine learning, the data science practice that you're going to encounter is that, for example, let's say a model that has a hundred predictors, all right? Uh, and let's take a time series. A uh, time series could, could have, if you extract different components from the date, different components from the lag, different components from the uh, Fourier series, seasonality, et cetera, you could have a model that could reach easily 60 to 70 per day. So one of the things that uh, you'll have to decide is, do I have to use all those predictors knowing that probably some of them are going to be you know, very similar 
uh, to each other. In other words, the information is the same. What well, that's what they call multicollinearity in this case. Or we can then prune, right? Prune the model and try to see which are the predictors from that you know, whole set, which are the predictors that really are giving me the most bang, right? The most bang for, 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 the, for the model. And we can see it, for example, if you, are, if you have done a random forest or even a, a logistic a regression, you see that when you do a variable importance uh, analysis, you see that there's only a couple of predictors that are really impacting your uh, uh, your predictions, your 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 tar your your target, your forecast. So the authors uh, uh, give us certain metrics that can be used to define to define how many predictors are really uh, necessary to get a good you know a, a good result, a, a good metric, and. I, because the information was kind of, uh, you know, very verbose, what I did was uh, create a table, okay? That's one of my techniques. I created a table to try to organize that information in a very, you know, succinct way. So here we have five metrics that can be used according to the authors and according to other uh, uh, literature can be used to uh, determine how many predictors do you need from the whole set of predictors that you have available. These are the adjusted R square that we saw in the in that model. So for example, adjusted R square, what you do is that you take out one predictor and check, you know, what is the what is the the the, the impact on the model. Or you can start with the a first predictor and then add. You can go uh, stepwise. You can go forward. You can you can go back. Then we have cross validation, and what cross validation is going to do is it's kind of a leave out leave out one uh, validation. Okay, we're going to run with the whole set, then leave out one, then incorporate it, leave out another, etc. The problem is that even though it's more efficient than the stepwise. Uh, it could be uh, time consuming, you know, if you don't have, uh, uh, you know, a powerful, a powerful uh, uh, machine, it could, it, it could take, it could, take, it could take a while. Then we have the AIC, which we're going to see later in the RIMA models. It's called the Akaike Information Criteria, AIC. And there, this, there, there, there's the formula, but what it does is that it penalizes the fit of the model with the number of predictors that you're using. In other words, it favors models with less predictors than more predictors. Then we have the IAC and you know a small c, which is the corrected uh, k information criterion, which is an adjustment like the like the adjusted R square is an adjustment of the AIC, okay, for bias uh, correction. Then we have the BIC, which is the Schwartz Bayesian uh, Information Criterion, which is similar to the AIC, and also it penalizes uh, the number of parameters. So to give an example of how you can use uh, this, uh, this metrics. Okay, let me see if I can, I can, I can, I can, I can, I can do this. Okay, so this table illustrates, ah, there's Federica. Hey. <laughs> uh, this table uh, is in uh, section 7.5, illustrates uh, the model for the US consumption. This is the model here. Okay. Uh, this is a fit of the U US, U US consumption models. We have income, we have salary, and other you know, uh, predictors to predict consumption. So in this one, we only have. Thank God, we only have four predictors. But we want to see, this is a model that we want to see what is the effect of taking one of the predictors, you know, doing all the combinations from zero predictors, which is the intercept, okay? Remember, it's a linear model, so the intercept is always going to be there without predictors, then adding one by one, then selecting 
two by two, you know, the pairs that correspond, and eventually getting the model for all the predictors, which are four. And as you can see, in the adjusted R square, uh, we're going to maximize that, uh, that, uh, that metric. In other words, higher is better. So here, with the four predictors, you get the highest adjusted R square. Okay. And with the CV and the other ones, AIC, AIC, small c, and BIC, you are minimizing. Lower is better. The only one that is not that way is the adjusted R square. You know, that, that higher is better. So CV, right now, with the four predictors, you get the lowest uh, uh, CV, CV uh, 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 value, which is the best model. For the IC, even though there are other uh, uh, you know, it's negative value, so we have, we have to think backwards. Here, also, it concurs with the other uh, metrics that the IC with four predictors also is the best model. The same with IACC and BIC, okay? So uh, that's basically for the selection. But remember, uh, in the selection, usually, in, the, in practice, what you're going to do is that you have, for example, a, a model that has 100 predictors. So usually what you do is that you select, depending on the metric, you select different sets of predictors, okay? Uh, for example, you, you select four uh, set of predictors, and then you use each of those sets with the models doing the, permu the corresponding permutations and then you get a, 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 a more sensible uh, output of how those set of predictors are interacting with the models and then try to get the best model with the best set of predictors, all right? So you have to do some, some experimentation uh, here. It's not that straight uh, uh, forward because each predictor, the, the interaction with the other predictors could be you know, missing if you only go with one with one set. Okay. All right. So that's what you know the predictors. Uh, I think the you know at least the table, which could be you know a, a source of reference, you know, could be useful to try to see you know which are the difference between the metrics and also which are the advantages and disadvantages. All right. Okay. Okay, I had the table there, good. All right, so in section 7.6, let me see, okay. In 7.6, uh, the author talks about two concepts in terms of the forecast. It, he talks about ex ante, right, and ex post. In other words, ex ante uh, refers to using only the information that you had at that moment, all right? So for example, if we're trying to forecast uh, certain behaviors in the rest of 2023, right? For example, retail sales or beer production or US consumption. So we're going to have only the data that is available until, until today, right? Okay, so we're going to use that and then Use it to uh, uh, do the uh, our future our future uh, values for the rest of the year. That's that could be an ex ante an example of an ex ante uh, forecast. The ex post forecasts are made, but then you are allowed to use information that was not available at the time when you did the forecast. So let's take the same example twenty the the you know today twenty twenty three. I'm going to forecast. Uh, the rest of the year, uh, let's say uh, production. Sorry, I have a, I'm having a, an issue with the with the chair <laughs> here. It's going down. Okay, so uh, the X pass, you have X amount of information available until today, right? But then you do the forecast, and then you can use the information that came later to try to assess what was the effectiveness of that, of, that, uh, of that forecast. Or you can also see, for example, in the COVID, 
uh, period, you can see what was the tendency before the COVID period and during the COVID period to see what is the magnitude of, let's say, of loss or the magnitude of gain, uh, depending on that particular on that particular uh, period that you that you are studying. So there's room for both. It just depends on what is the goal of your study. If your study is, you know, basically to forecast uh, future, you know, future behavior, future values, then usually what you do is ex ante because you cannot, you can, you cannot get future data into your, into your mix. But if you're going to evaluate certain behaviors after, you know, your your horizon, right after that that cut off time then you can use that, you know, ex post uh, forecast. Uh, and we use it, uh, especially in, in, in economy. Uh, we use it a lot, okay? To try to see, okay, we predicted that, that inflation was going to be, for the rest year, was to be 6%. And now we know that from the data that we're gathering is going to be maybe 5%. So that's an example of, the, of that ex post uh, forecast trying to assess the effectiveness of that, of that forecast that we did at this particular time, okay? Okay, so that's basically, you know, what, what the, the authors are, are, uh, wanted to convey. Okay, so let's go back to the beer production, right? Now uh, we're going to use the same data set uh, after 1992, we're going to fit it, and then we're going to plot it. And one of the things that we are now introducing here is what is called the prediction uh, intervals. And as you can see, there is a 80 level, 80% prediction interval and also a 95. Okay, let me see. Okay, and we're using the trend, we're using the seasonality here, et cetera. All right. Then what we want to do here is trying to do different scenarios, okay? We have our forecast already, but we, we want to see, okay, what happens if one of the parameters, instead of being what, you know, what the data is telling us, uh, we change it, okay? So in here, we're going to, we're going to change, uh, you know, some parameters. For example, in the income, we're going to assume that the increase is going to be 1%. And then in another scenario, we're going to assume that the increase of the income is going to be minus 1%. Okay, so we have a scenario of 1% of income and savings uh, growth, and one scenario of minus income and savings. It's like a simulation uh, here. And these are the results, okay? The, the green band, the green band is going to give you the forecast for when the income is uh, assumed to grow by 1%. And then the red one is going to be the income growing minus uh, 1%. In other words, it's going to be decreasing 1%. And you get both. So you have both scenarios. What are you going to do? You have to wait for the data, right? You have to wait for the data to see which one is the one that really gives you the best, the best estimate, okay? So a combination here, combination of ex ante and ex post here, because we're assuming certain things that could happen in the future. And we want to see if which of the scenarios are fitting better our, our results, but in the future, all right? Also, uh, we call this uh, what if, uh, what if analysis, all right? And usually, uh, you know, if, if you work in an organization, uh, usually you're going to be asked, okay, if our uh, estimate of this parameter, let's say uh, inflation, which is, you know, pretty now in, in bulk, right? Because we have had an inflationary period. Okay, what happens in inflation? stays at this level, let's say 6%, if it increases at 7% or decreases at 5%.
what is the effect of that in your model? And then, you know, you give management or you give the person with the decision this, this option. Okay, if it goes 1%, this is what we forecast. If it stables, this is what we forecast. If it is decreases, this is what it is. All right. All right. So uh, here, uh, we're going to be build a predictive regression with the same data. Uh, this is the same data with the uh, US uh, consumption, sorry. All right. And then we're going to see an average increase in terms of the mean of that income uh, parameter, right? Okay, we're going to assume that the mean is going to stay. It's going to be the parameter that is going to stay. And then we're going to do one that is extreme increase, which is the change of that you know, particular uh, variable you know, in, in, that, in that period. For, uh, in, in other words, the, the new data is going to be 12. Okay, so depending on what is the change, now it's going to be, uh, it, could, it could be double, et cetera. And the same thing. Uh, this one is going to be with the stream increase on income. And the red one is going to be with the average increase. And you have the numbers and you have to see which one is going to be a better fit. It's another uh, case of the same, of, of the same procedure. Okay. So we're going to be talking now about nonlinear regression. Here, what is happening is that you know that your time series, what you expect is that the trend is increasing, right? The trend is stable or the trend is, is decreasing, but it's at a steady pace. What happens if in the time series, there are different periods where there's a steep decrease, there is an increase, and then there's stability. So you can have different chunks and different periods that there's some nonlinearity between each of the periods. In other words, the line that you are trying to accommodate here or that you're trying to fit is not a good fit. So you have to do certain, uh, you have to use certain mechanisms. Okay, uh, some in when we talk about when we when we discuss our introduction to statistical learning, we talk about splines, for example. Okay, which is you know those change points where the the, the slope of that line is going to change. Oh well, well, something like that in in this particular scenario. And one of the scenarios that the authors uh, uh, illust illustrate to us is the Boston Marathon winning, winning times. Okay, so we have this data set of uh, the event, in this case, this case is the men's uh, open division, the year, who won, uh, the nationality of the person that won, and the time uh, recorded for, for, the, for the length of the, of the race. Uh, we know that the marathon usually is 26 miles, 26.2 miles. Okay, or uh, give that equivalent in kilometers. So we have seen over the years, right? We have seen that that time of completing that race for the first one, for the, you know, for the winner, it has been decreasing. The only problem is that if you try to fit a line, you will see that some of these periods are not going to be aligned with that line, okay? Some of them, they could be a little bit more, you know, uh, steep in the slope. Others is stable, and others, you know, just follow, you know, kind of a, a smooth, a smooth curve. So, if we do a method LM here, this is what we get. So we don't get a good fit. You know, we can see it right now, especially here. Okay, that we see that it's stabilizing because it's harder every time. It's harder to get. Uh, 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 you know, a, a dramatic change in that completion of the time of the marathon because, you know, there, there's human uh, limitations, okay? So if we use a loss, right, or lush, uh, I've, I've seen it, you know, happening, 
Okay, now we get a better idea of what is going on. So as we can see from this period here, there was a steep decrease of that time, right? Of the marathon time. Then something happened here that it started stabilizing, okay? And then here it stabilizes, it's kind of a, you know, it's flat really, the trend, and then it goes up a little bit. <laughs> okay, apparently, you know, who knows, maybe there was weather patterns or something or something happened that uh, there was an increase in time instead of keep, keep the, the time, you know, decreasing. Okay, so if we do our TSLM, right, our, you know, famous linear regression for time series, um, we try to predict minutes by the year, which is basically the trend, okay, by the years, it is going to be going to give you a trend. When you look at the residuals, you see that the residuals have a pattern here. They, they cannot have a pattern. When we do residuals diagnostics, the residuals should be random, okay? But right now we see that they go up, they go down, they go up again. <laughs> so this is not a good, a good model. The same here with the lags. There's information here that the model is missing. Okay, in terms of the lags, because those lags above the, the blue colored dotted line, they're significant. And also, you know, the pattern of the distribution, which is kind of, you know, skewed to the right. Okay, so that definitely this is not, you know, the best model that we could, that we could see. So how, how can we, you know, tailor it or try to tinker with the model? So we have to incorporate like we did in, in the introduction to statistical learning, we have to incorporate, they call it piecewise here, but it's basically a spline, okay? You know, in certain periods, you are, are, go, are going to have one model, then you're going to switch to another model, you know, to fit the best fit of that period, and then another model, as many models as, as is necessary. Usually three or four should be, should be enough. And that's what the authors are, are doing here. They're doing, a linear uh, model for the trend. They're doing an exponential with a log, an exponential model with the minutes for the trend. And then you're, they're going to have a spline here, okay? In other words, in 1950, there's going to be a change, a change point in the, you know, in the models. And also in 1980. So why? Because they have determined that those are the points where the trend starts to change in that, that time series. So I want to have two change points in the 1950 and also in uh, 1950 and 1980. And we're going to have a linear component and also a log uh, component, okay? So the linear, we know how is it going to behave. It's going to behave really uh, clunky, okay? That is the line. Then the exponential is going to try, you know, to get a little bit, you know, the, 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 the trend here, especially here, but it's not going to do a good job. The only one that does a good job is this piecewise, the spline, okay? Which, as you can see, there's a line here, a trend, then it changes, okay? And then it, it stays flat. So this is the one that is really is capturing, you know, all this, uh, all the signals that piecewise uh, component, okay? At least visually. And also if we do, you know, the other, you know, uh, statistical uh, parameters, we'll see that that will be uh, the best model, okay? Okay, so we already saw this in, the, in our last session about correlation. One of the things that the authors, uh, you know, hammer in, in, in the book in, in, in various sections is that correlation is not causation. Causation, very good. <laughs> correlation is not causation. And what do we mean by that? Okay, remember that we saw in last, last session, it was at, at the last, you know, minutes, we saw what is called spurious uh, correlations, okay? Things that they don't have anything in common and they have, you know, a, a good correlation, right? You know, in terms of the numbers. 
So, for example, the suicides and you know, the number of diapers uh, sold in the U.S., things like that. Okay. What's happening is that usually the predictors, the predictors, they're going to be correlated between themselves, but one is not causing the other. Okay. Usually what happens is that there's something in between them that is the one that, you know, gets that causation uh, link, okay? And that missing piece, that missing piece that you need between those uh, predictors, between those magnitudes, is called a confounder, okay? And usually it's not there, it's not there. For example, if I have, a predictor of people, uh, smokers, smokers in, in, in a nation. Uh, let's say, uh, let's pick one, uh, Switzerland, okay? Uh, smokers, right? Switzerland. And also you have another uh, uh, predictors of eating habits, okay? So by our knowledge, we know that Usually people that smoke, it affects its appetite, right? Okay. People that smoke, usually they, you know, they have a, 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 a very, you know, less than average uh, appetite because part of the metabolism is getting, you know, a high with that smoking uh, element, nicotine, that then suppresses uh, the, the, the desire to, to eat. So we can see that there's a correlation, but that one causes the other, hmm, maybe not, okay? Maybe there's some things in there between them that then you have to consider to make that, that link, okay? Maybe it is, maybe it's not, but usually the rule is that correlation is not causation. So you cannot say, I hope you don't say it, that one predictor causes the other, okay? You have to be very certain of what you know you are you know you're, you're, you're in, the, in the statement and you have to have a very direct link on that usually what happens is that if you have that direct link the only you need one predictor because they're going to be so highly correlated that then you know it's going to cause problems in your in your in your model okay okay so uh there's another section of forecasting, right? With correlated predictors. And the same thing happens in, in, the, in the models that we have seen, uh, regression models, uh, distance uh, uh, models. That is always a challenge because when you have predictors that are very highly correlated, they tend to inflate their, their importance, okay? That's why you have the variance uh, inflation factor and you have things you know, to you know, spot if two or more predictors are very highly correlated and it wrecks havoc on regression, on you know, KNNs, anything that uses distance is going to be affected by uh, the multicollinearity that we're seeing. And the time series is not a, you know, it's, it's not immune to that, okay? It's, it's, going to, it's going to take an effect. So what you have to do is try to see if with one predictor, you can have the information from the other, or to combine it in a way to uh, decrease the correlation. One of the techniques that we know that is very helpful for that is PCA, principal component analysis, okay? It decorrelates uh, those, uh, those uh, you know, col uh, more, uh, uh, high collinearities between the predictor, okay? All right, okay, another, uh, uh, you know, a tidbit on the multicollinearity, et cetera. So uh, be, be careful with that, especially with models that have a lot of predictors. Uh, usually you don't need them that, that many, okay? Because some of them are going to be highly significant and then the rest is going to be more noise. Okay. Yeah, for example, uh, that, that's a good example here. That, that's what I, 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 I left it here. It says, Hence, they're providing similar information. In other words, talking about two predictors that are very highly correlated. For example, food size can be used to predict height, right? But including the size of both left and right feet in the same model is not going to make the forecast any better. You only need one, right? 
You don't need both. <laughs> okay, you only need one. You know, the left or the right, you know, pick, take a pick. Take a pick, but you don't need both because they have the same information. You know, how many people have different, you know, uh, you know, feet size, left, left and right? I mean, they could be, okay? They could be because of the circumstances. But usually that, that's not what happened. And if it happens, then we should, uh, uh, we should question the use of that magnitude, okay? Especially, you know, let's say, you know, people had, had accidents, right? Okay, so the length is not, is not the same. Okay. Let me see again what we have here. Okay, so that's it. <laughs> that's the discussion of chapter seven. Uh, there's a lot of material here. <laughs> Right. Okay, so uh, we only have nine minutes. Uh, so what we can do, uh, Federica, is to start the next session with the exercise. Hopefully it's going to take around 15 minutes, the exercise, but it's relevant because there's some questions there that you have to, you know, go out, out of, the, of the text, you know, to find the, to find the answers. Okay, they're, they're not given there. I mean, the, the text helps you, but you have to do, you know, a, a, couple of, a couple of research there. That's why this particular uh, article of tidy forecasting in R helped me in getting some functions that they're not even in the package. I mean, I'm mentioning the package <laughs> mm -hmm. that are included that it will, it will help you, uh, especially the, you know, uh, determining the magnitude of the prediction inter intervals, okay? Mm -hmm. Which, you know, gave me a, Give me a little bit of trouble. Uh, so that that one that one will, will help a lot, you know, for for that exercise one. So what we can do is start, you know, with that discussion, uh, fifty minutes, and then move on. Okay. So that's all I have. <laughs> Maybe maybe you can uh, open the the page for for the uh -huh. exercise so we read it. Oh, uh, for the exercise. You mean for the exercise? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, this is the first one. Okay, uh -huh. uh, the number one. It says a half hourly electricity demand for Victoria Australia is contained in big underscore elect. That's the data set. Mm -hmm. Extract the January 2014. So you're going to have you're going to do a filter, right? Extract the January 2014 electricity demand and aggregate this data to daily with, in other words, because it's half hour, then you're going to group by by by, by date, right? To get the, the daily component. And then you're going to summarize, right? the demand by total daily demand and there's another regressor there that is temperature okay which is a predictor temperature you are going then to choose the maximum from that particular day mm -hmm. okay and the author uh, helps you and gives you gives you the script you know to get that information uh subset it in the way that he described then we're going to plot the data and find the regression model for demand with temperature as a predict predictor value. So we're going to use TSLM, right? The TSLM function that we have been discussing, we're going to use that. And you're, there's a question that says, why is there a positive relationship? Okay, and we can you know, do some discussion. Then we're going to produce a residual plot that's going to be with the function GG residuals that we saw, you know, when we plot the residuals, the lags and the distribution, and the author asks you, is the model adequate? Are there any liars or influential observations? Then using the model to forecast the electricity demand that you expect for the next day. So if we're in January, right, from January 1st to January 31st, then the next day is going to be 
Uh, the next uh, day is going to be? And I will, I will so, um, so uh, use the model to target. Yeah, you're, you're using only January. So yeah. you have from January 1st to January 31st. Um, so what's going to be the next day? The first day of the next, the, the following month. Right, which is? The day after. Which, right. Which is the first of, um, the rest of yeah. the, the following month. Yeah, which is? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's February. It's the, the month next to January. Uh, the, February, you know? February, yeah. there you go. February 1st. You're going to forecast February 1st of 2014 using January, uh, the January uh, actual auto data. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, we're going to do kind of a what if scenario, right? Yeah. We're going to use the temperature. We're going to assume that the temperature for that day, the maximum temperature is going to be 15 degrees Celsius. And you're going to forecast it for that. Then you're going to change the maximum temperature. And now you're going to say, okay, what about if the high maximum temperature is going to be 35 degrees? So you're going to have to forecast now, right? Okay, one with 15 degrees and one with 35 uh, degrees. And the question is, do you believe this forecast? Mm -hmm. Okay, one hint. We already know what the temperature and the actual demand was for February because we have the data. So we can compare, okay? So one of them is going to be less ideal than the other, okay? So, but I don't want to you know, spoil the, the, the surprise. <laughs> Okay, now, this one was the one that gave me a little bit of headache. Give the prediction intervals for your forecast for the 15 degrees Celsius and the 35 degrees Celsius. That's where that link of the blog of uh, Rob Hinman comes handy <laughs> because there's a function, it doesn't appear in the package, doesn't appear anywhere. There's a function that gives you exactly that, <laughs> okay? So check, check the article. Then, we're going to plot the demand versus temperature for all the available data. In other words, it's going to be not general, it's going to be the whole, the whole data set. Aggregated to daily total demand and maximum temperature that we did in January. And then you're going to assess what does the model say about, you know, the whole, the whole pattern of the, the whole, I think it's a whole year of, uh, you know, of, of, of electricity uh, demand numbers, okay? Mm -hmm. And that's it. It's a, it's a good exercise, let me tell you, because it covers more or less all the basic things that we uh, discuss in the, in the chat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Okay. If you have any, you know, if you get stuck in one of those things, uh, I have already the exercises. I have it in my GitHub. Okay, so you know you can use a compare, and maybe if there's something that I miss, then please you know let me know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. So let's continue next week with this uh, sure. exercise. Yeah. Okay, Federica. Well, have a great weekend. Uh, we'll see you uh, next Friday. Go with Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Okay.